Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Tim Fazekas. Tim earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry at Boston College before coming to UNC Chapel Hill to pursue his PhD. While there, he worked on radical-based chemistry in the Alexanian group. In 2021, he finished up at Chapel Hill and came to Dartmouth, where he now works as a postdoctoral researcher in the Michelizio group. And with that, I'll let you get started, Tim. Thanks a lot for joining us today. So thanks, Matt, for having me. We overlap for just a bit at UNC, where Matt was working in the Johnson group and I was in the Alexanian group. I'm now a postdoc in the Michelizio group up at Dartmouth, so it's great to see the recent highlight of their synthesis of anhydrorayanidol. Uh, but today I'll be talking about some of my work from UNC on intermolecular SP3CH functionalization. So while CH functionalization has recently kind of come into vogue again, an intermolecular SP3CH functionalization is probably one of the first reactions we learn in sophomore organic chemistry. This is one of the oldest known reactions and it's one of the most fundamental. You take a saturated alkane and install some sort of functional handle. So in this type of reaction, we first have an initiation event in which a chlorine-chlorine bond is homolyzed to give a chlorine-centered radical. This chlorine-centered radical then engages in our first chain propagation step through a hydrogen atom transfer. This gives a carbon-centered radical, which can then engage in our second propagation step, a chain transfer step in which the carbon-centered radical picks up a chlorine and we regenerate a chlorine-centered radical, which goes back into our radical chain. So the second thing we probably learn is that these radical chain reactions aren't always super selective. So a CH bromination reaction can be highly selective for tertiary bromination, while a fluorination reaction is almost non-selective. And this is because of the Hammond postulate. So this bromination reaction is almost endothermic. This leads to a pretty late transition state and a pretty selective reaction. On the other hand, a CH fluorination reaction is highly exothermic, so a very early transition state leads to pretty low selectivity. So why do we still care about CH functionalization? Well, in general, it's a way to take a late stage intermediate and install some new functionality. So lots of methods are known, with sclerolide being a commonly used model late stage substrate. And in these methods, the C2 hydrogen is abstracted, giving some intermediate, whether it be an alkyl metal or a free radical. This could then be trapped by a number of different methods to give a CH functionalization product. Cernak commented in a review that viewed collectively the power of having a toolbox of complementary CH functionalization reactions and generating diversity around a common core becomes apparent, especially when you're thinking about late stage functionalization and finding lead drug molecules for uh, drug campaigns. The use of nitrogen-centered radicals in CH functionalization dates back to the 1910s. So the Vol-Ziegler reaction uses these N-bromoacetamides to functionalize alkanes at these activated allylic positions. Although this reaction might work just through the slow release of Br2. In the 1960s, Manishi found that he could use these N-chloramines in combination with reducing iron salts and insulfuric acid to functionalize methylhexanoate at the omega-1 position. A couple years later, Dino found that adding steric bulk around these n-chloramines allowed them to preferentially functionalize at the secondary position over the naturally favored tertiary position. Building upon this precedent, Alexanian co-workers in 2014 disclosed a CH bromination reaction using this n-bromoamide reagent. This reaction is highly selective for secondary bromination over the electronically favored tertiary bromination products. In 2016, this was extended to CH chlorination and used in the total synthesis of chlorosoclamide, and more recently was used in the CH xanthylation of a number of alkane substrates, with the added benefit that these xanthate products are highly diversifiable. The drawback to all these reactions is that we're limited to transferring the group that's directly appended to the amide reagent. So unfortunately, you can't just install whatever group you want onto an amide and have it engage in this CH functionalization process. Mechanistically, each of these reactions is similar, starting with an initiation event to give an amidyl radical. This amidyl radical is then a potent HAT agent to give a carbon-centered radical, with this step being about 10 kcals downhill. This carbon-centered radical can then engage in a chain transfer event to give a functionalized product as well as another equivalent of amidyl radical. 
When we go to think about installing groups that aren't just appended to our AMID reagent, where we have to focus is on this third step. So we need to somehow decouple the trapping of this carbon-centered radical from this chain transfer event. Our first strategy towards accomplishing this goal was through a proton coupled to electron transfer strategy. We would have a base pulling on this amidyl NH bond. This amide can then simultaneously be deprotonated and oxidized to give an amidyl radical. This amidyl radical could then engage in HAT to give a carbon centered radical, which could be trapped by external trapping agent. This Y radical could then be reduced and reprotonated to turn over our catalytic cycle. Unfortunately, low reactivity attributed to issues with back electron transfer after that initial PSET step and with product inhibition after the formation of this YH byproduct limited these type of efforts. So we return to our tried and true radical chain mechanisms. So we first thought that we could use this xanthate of our xanthalamide as a quote unquote dummy substituent. So in our normal xanthalation reaction, we have this carbon centered radical, which can add into the thiocarbonyl of this xanthalamide reagent. We then form this kind of stabilized captidative radical, and that's actually a reversible step. So we can undergo CS bond fragmentation to give back our carbon centered radical, leading to a pretty high effective lifetime of this carbon centered radical. In our xanthalation reaction, at some point we will fragment out the other way, so NS bond fragmentation will give the CH xanthalation product as well as another equivalent of our amidyl radical. We thought that we could take advantage of the high effective lifetime of this carbon centered radical and instead add in some irreversible trap like a nitrile to give this CH cyanation product. This would additionally form some R radical, which we hoped could engage in a chain propagation step to give another equivalent of our amidyl radical. So effectively what we're doing here is asking a kinetic question, and that's can we intercept a carbon centered radical with a fast radical trap? The answer to this question is kind of. So I was able to introduce tosyl cyanide in our xanthate and see the cyanation products. So with simple hydrocarbons, we saw somewhat middling yields. I was able to additionally functionalize alpha to heteroatoms and benzylic positions, as well as a couple of more complex molecules. Uh, so it seems like, unfortunately, kinetics alone isn't the answer. If we go back to our mechanism and wonder where things are going wrong, it was probably in this chain propagation step. So our R radical that we form after trapping the carbon centered radical is supposed to add into our thiocarbonyl and fragment out to give this byproduct. Unfortunately, there's probably not a high driving force for this particular step, and we'd get competitive CH xanthalation as well as other byproducts. Luckily, around the same time, I was looking into this new class of reagents, these O-alkenyl hydroxamate reagents. I initially thought that this could engage in the CH alkylation reaction. How we envision this working is through first an initiation event to give our amidyl radical that engages in HAT, and our carbon-centered radical could then add into another equivalent of our reagent. This would then fragment out similarly to our CH xanthalation process to give this alkylation product as well as another equivalent of an amidyl radical. Unfortunately, we saw a pretty low reactivity of this intended reaction pathway. This was attributed to a slow addition step, so while this is probably irreversible, we have electronic mismatch here. So we have an electron-rich carbon-centered radical trying to add into an electron-rich alkene here. This leads to a pretty slow addition step. What this actually did was introduce an opportunity for us. So adding in a radical trap to this same reaction manifold, after our hydrogen atom transfer step, we have this electron-rich alkene, which can then engage in group transfer with this electrophilic fluorine source, NFSI. This would give a CH fluorination product as well as this imineal radical, which is electron poor and electronically matched for addition into another equivalent of our alkene reagent. This can fragment out to give this byproduct as well as another equivalent of our amidyl radical. So doing exactly that, I ran this reaction with two equivalents of NFSI and saw a 40% yield of our fluorinated sclerolide product at a first pass. Utilizing a related reagent without the 3,5-bis CF3 groups, we saw a lower yield. Similarly, using a fluoramid reagent, we saw no yield of our CH fluorination product. So it's not that we're just forming our NF fluoramid reagent in situ and that being responsible for our reactivity. 
Additionally, the xanthate reagent gave none of the intended CH fluorination product and only CH xanthylation. So clearly this reactivity is unique to this particular alkenyl hydroxamate reagent. Increasing to two equivalents of dummy reagent bumped up the yield to 64%. And then interestingly, while I was investigating the utility of adding some radical initiators to the reaction, I found that you don't actually need the initiators and simply heating this reaction to 70 degrees allowed the reaction to go in 74% yield. So that's highly enabling when we start to think about scale up of these type of reactions. We don't need specialized equipment like we would in these blue light mediated reactions if we can simply use thermolytic conditions. Next, I looked into the scope of traps that could work in this type of a system using cyclooctane as a model substrate. So I was able to show that the CH fluorination works here, as well as the CH chlorination and CH bromination. Additionally, I found that using a perfluoroalkyl iodide allows for the CH iodination. So this isn't a reaction that's possible using our traditional free radical halogenation as it's significantly uphill. And this also is really a known reaction. There's only a couple of examples in the literature of a CH iodination reaction, and they're on a pretty limited scope of substrates. We also were able to demonstrate the CH acidation, cyanation, trifluoromethylthiolation, and thioetherification of cyclooctane, as well as the addition of this phenyl tetrazolthiol and alkenylation reaction. Next, we turn to the scope of these reactions. So a number of simple hydrocarbons work with similar selectivity to our previously published work. So uh, pretty secondary selective when it comes to reactions on substrates like 3-methylpentane or selective for the omega-1 position in methylhexanoate or this straight-chain thalamid. Additionally, we showed that we were able to functionalize some more complex drug-like molecules, like this enthalamid memantine substrate, or this different precursor, uh, ibuprofen methyl ester. We functionalized next to the oxygen and imbroxide, and in the steroidal systems, we functionalize on the A-ring, on deoxyandrosterone, but when there is a sterically bulky acetate group at the C3 group of this acetyl androsterone substrate, we preferentially functionalize on the B ring. Lastly, to kind of demonstrate the power of this reaction, we uh, performed the CH functionalization of sclerulide and showed that we were able to do a CH fluorination, CH chlorination, uh, bromination, and azidation, as well as the trifluoromethylthiolation. The CH iodination of sclerolide works extremely efficiently. So on small scale, we're able to observe up to 98% yield of that iodinated sclerolide compound. And on gram scale, we're still able to isolate 75 to 80% yield of this alkyl iodide product. So Austin Miller and our group really spearheaded the efforts towards further diversification using this alkyl iodide as a linchpin, since this C2 iodinated sclerolide product hadn't really been demonstrated before. Uh, so Austin was able to show that you can transform this into a formal CH borylation product, as well as the formal CH methylation product. We were able to use iron conditions to afford the CH aerylation product, and use some Greg Fu conditions to transform this into the CH aminated product, so a formal alkane amine dehydrogenative coupling. Austin also showed that he was able to append their phenyl tetrazole thiol, and this could potentially be used as another linchpin in reactions like Julio olefinations, cross couplings, etc. So, with the small molecule side of our system pretty much wrapped up, uh, we tried to apply this towards polyolefin substrates, and I'll refer you to the paper for a more in depth discussion since I'm more of the small molecule expert. Uh, but fundamentally, Jill showed that you were able to use pretty much the full scope of reactions on linear low density polyethylene as a kind of model substrate. She's also able to demonstrate a subset of these reactions on the high density polyethylene, which is a less branched, more crystalline polymer, as well as a more branched, less crystalline, low density polyethylene. She was able to demonstrate the applicability of this reaction on post-industrial polyethylene which was scavenged from the remains of some packaging forms, as well as the 
application of this reaction to post-consumer polyethylene, which was gotten from foam packaging. So these are excellent examples of polymer upcycling, so turning a waste stream polymer into a value-added material. Eliza was also able to show that you could scale up this reaction to a multigram scale using a twin screw extruder, and she was also able to functionalize isotactic polypropylene. Uh, lastly, Jill also was able to develop conditions to append this thioether with a terminal bromide. She was then able to add in a midazole, which could substitute on that terminal bromide and rapidly form these ionomer complexes. And these have really unique physical properties, so including increased tensile toughness, etc. In summary, I was able to develop this novel reagent for CH diversification under thermolytic conditions, which can be applied to a number of complex molecules, as well as finding applicability in the upcycling of commodity and waste stream polymers. Again, thank you to Matt for having me. Additionally, thank you to Eric and Frank for being great advisors, uh, to all the members of the Alexanian lab, but specifically to Will and Christina for all the work they did in the CH xanthylation, which really set the stage for the work that I was able to accomplish. And additionally to the members of Team Dummy Reagent, which are Austin, Jill, and Eliza, who are just excellent co-workers. So thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Tim for sharing your work with us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.